My name is Michelle Christ. I'm a landscape ecologist with BLM Fire and Aviation at the National Interagency Fire Center. And I'd like to thank Jean for inviting me to give this talk today at the symposium. Uh, my talk today will be on wildland fire and vegetation management strategies that we developed and used in the science framework, part one and two. And at this time, I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jean Chambers and Jonathan Skinner, who's a mitigation and outreach specialist at BLM Fire and Aviation, and also a colleague of mine. So to help understand sagebrush wildfire management, I'm just gonna provide a brief context of how wildfire trends have changed over time across the sagebrush biome. Historically, fire cycles were highly variable across the sagebrush biome, where fire return intervals ranged from several decades in colder, moisture, higher elevations to hundreds of years in the hotter, drier, lower elevations. And these fire cycles had a strong influence on sagebrush landscape structure and helped to create these large expansive areas that were dominated by dense sagebrush. So the contemporary fire cycles we've seen substantially change from those historic trends where fire cycles in the hotter, drier, lower elevations uh, the return intervals are much shorter and don't allow time for full recovery of sagebrush communities. And this is mainly due to an interaction with an annual invasive grasses where we're seeing bee burns occur on average every seven to 15 years. Uh, we've also seen an increase in area burned and large fire sizes. Fire cycles in the colder, moisture, higher elevations have also changed, but not to the same extent as those seen at the lower elevations. Uh, we've seen a shift towards smaller and less frequent fires. And this is mainly due to successful fire suppression efforts, as well as other human activities, such as human development and grazing practices that kind of help disrupt that field continuity in these areas. So between 1984 and 2013, over 7.2 million hectares burned in sagebrush dominated vegetation types. And over this time period, we've also seen an increase in annual area burn and larger fire size in some regions. And between 2014 and 2017, there was approximately 1.5 million hectares of greater sage grouse habitat burned in the U.S. And approximately 80% of that area was within the Great Basin. And just during this time period alone, very short time period, we have seen very large fire sizes that can range anywhere from over 40,000 hectares to over 200,000 hectares in size. The integrated rangeland fire management strategy's primary focus was to address fire in greater sage grouse conservation and habitat management. So for the science framework part one, we developed a greater sage grouse wildfire risk assessment. And we based this assessment on the premise that risk is equal to the probability of a threat and consequences of that threat, whether they, they be negative or positive. So for the probability of a threat, we used the large fire probability data set that was developed by Karen Short at the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Uh, for consequences of fire to greater sage grouse, we used the greater sage grouse breeding habitat probabilities that were developed by Kevin Doherty at Fish and Wildlife Service. And then we modified the consequences of fire to greater sage grouse habitat based on a habitat's resilience to fire and resistance to invasives. And we used a data set here that was developed by Jeremy Maestas at NRCS. Then just using a simple GIS analysis, we combined these three factors together. So the fire risk assessment depicts 27 different combinations of those three factors 
that at a broad scale, distinguish between habitats that are at risk to fire and their capacity to recover from fire and resist annual grass invasions. So for example, the darker green areas represent areas that have a, the lowest fire probability, the lowest habitat probability, and the highest resilience and resistance. And at the other end of the spectrum, in dark brown, um, these areas have the highest burn probability, the highest habitat probability, but the lowest resilience and resistance. So we can use this assessment to spatially target areas for wildfire management and also help determine the most appropriate types of wildfire management actions for wildfire suppression efforts and operations, for fire prevention strategies, for vegetation and fields management, and also for post-fire recovery. So there are many factors that determine the prioritization of fire preparedness and suppression resources. And a great example would be the wildland urban interface. A greater sage-grouse habitat designation, such as BLM's primary habitat management areas, are included as one of those factors. So this image here is a zoomed-in view of the Great Basin. And it represents a primary habitat management area shown in the black outlined polygons that's overlaid with the fire risk assessment. And as you can see here, just even within one habitat designation, there's a lot of variability in fire risk to greater sage grouse and the capacity of that habitat to recover from fire. So this assessment can help us address challenges of prioritizing suppression response to multiple fire ignitions within greater sage grouse habitat designations, such as the primary habitat management areas or the, pri or the priority areas of conservation. And it can also help us prioritize fire preparedness and suppression resources. So for example, in areas that have a medium to high value greater sage grouse habitat with a moderate to high wildfire risk, these areas really should be the higher priorities for our preparedness and suppression efforts, especially in those lower uh, resilience and resistance categories that are shown in the rust color. Whereas areas with the moderate to high resilience and resistance may be a lower priority because they often have the potential to recover naturally on their own without intervention. And that's shown here in sort of these green colors. Uh, Post-fire rehabilitated areas should also be considered a priority for fire suppression just to help protect um, those areas that we have restored and protect those investments. So the concepts of resilience and resistance are also helpful for determining the use of different fire operation tactics in different sagebrush communities. So for example, sites that are low value greater sage grouse habitat um, really should be high priorities for pre-positioning fire suppression resources. In addition, during fire events, there are certain tactics that can help maintain sagebrush seeding sources that are already established in our moderate and low resilience and resistance. So these tactics can include extinguishing fire edges and hot spots within the burn perimeter, applying suppression strategies and tactics to retain unburned sagebrush islands within burn perimeters, and constructing direct rather than indirect fire lines. And depending on the region, human-caused fire ignitions can range anywhere from 35 to 70% of all fire starts in sagebrush communities. So the most common causes of these human ignitions include power lines, vehicles, target shooting, campfires, and also fireworks. So here we would recommend additional spatial analyses that also include known causes of fire ignitions in wildfire risk assessments. And this type of information can help design 
and target our wildfire prevention strategies for many different local communities. So this assessment can also help inform the strategic placement of wildland fire vegetation management projects that can mitigate the collective effects of fire, enhance wildfire suppression efforts, and also help to restore habitat across the sagebrush biome. So here is just a very general approach for prioritizing management actions based on the 27 different combinations of fire risk. So in the first approach, um, in, it's really for those areas that are low to moderate, have a low to moderate burn probability, a high to moderate sage grouse habitat probability, and also a high to moderate resilience and resistance. And they're, they're shown here at, at the bottom of the slide, um, shown in the dark green circles. And so for those areas, um, we would recommend uh, restoration of sagebrush sage habitat. Um, for example, that would be the pinion and juniper removal in those expansion areas. Um, allow for natural recovery after fire. And also monitor for new invasive occurrences or spread. And in the second approach, um, these are for areas that have the high to moderate burn probabilities, high to moderate sage grouse probabilities, and also the low to moderate resilience and resistance sites. So here we would recommend the strategic placement of fuel reduction projects around higher quality habitats for protection from fire. We'd also pri recommend prioritizing our fire prevention and mitigation efforts in these areas. Um, prioritize our post-fire rehabilitation efforts in these areas. And also monitor the continual spread of invasives. And lastly, in areas that have a high burn probability, a low sage grouse habitat probability, and a low resilience and resistance. And this is shown in sort of the peachy colored and, and the peach colored circle here in the key at the bottom of the slide. And so in those areas really should be high priority areas for siting fuel reduction projects. And then we could continue to monitor and manage the conditions within those fuel reduction projects and manage them accordingly. And we would also recommend prioritizing our fire prevention and mitigation efforts in these areas to help reduce those human-caused ignitions. So in those areas that have that low to moderate fire risk and high to moderate value of greater sage grouse habitats and high to moderate resilience and resistance, um, those management actions should include the prioritization of restoration of that early to mid-phase pinion and juniper expansion, um, especially where those pinion and juniper have expanded into currently occupied greater sage grouse breeding habitats. Um, treatments should be conducted in areas with sufficient native perennial grasses and forbs. And we also need to manage for certain trade-offs, especially for those um, trade-offs with sharply declining pinion and juniper associated species, such as the pinion jay. And for those areas that have a high to moderate fire risk, high to moderate value of greater sage grouse habitat, and low to moderate resilience and resistance, here, the overall goal should really be focused on fuel reduction strategies. And here we recommend strategically placing treatments so that collectively they can disrupt connected fields and also allow a safe space for fire suppression efforts. And so here, those lower value greater sage grouse habitats really should be the high priorities for siting of these field reduction projects, especially 
if those low value habitats are located in and around the higher value greater sage grouse habitats that have a moderate to high fire risk and low resilience and resistance so that we can protect them from fire. And there are a few trade-offs to consider here when using these fuel reduction strategies. Um, and first would be that there is limited research on fuel break effectiveness as well as the impacts to wildlife and plant communities. Um, there's also the potential for further loss and fragmentation of greater sage grouse habitat. Uh, these fuel breaks could also be a potential vector for spread of planted non-natives, as well as a potential vector for the spread of invasives. And then just we as an agency need to make a commitment to funding the long-term maintenance of these fuel breaks or green strips. So our post-fire rehabilitation efforts should target those areas that have a moderate to high value greater sage grouse habitat and also have the low to moderate resilience and resistance. And so here we develop two different recommendations. Um, the first is to use our post-fire rehabilitation efforts to, to create resilience to fire and resistance to invasives. And we could do this by establishing patches of diverse native forbs, bunch grasses, and other shrubs to mimic the natural recovery succession of sagebrush communities after fire. In addition, grazing deferment or changes in season of use can also help protect these restoration investments. And our second recommendation is to increase connectivity, and, and here we're talking about shrub connectivity across these burned areas to help protect wildlife species that occur here to protect them from predators. And so here we would target our rehabilitation efforts between sagebrush patch refugia in these burned areas that can help increase that sagebrush habitat connectivity, important for those species. So in summary, wildfire management is very broad and it's very complex. And the concepts of resilience and resistance can help with managing wildland fire risk. It can help us by prioritizing our wildfire suppression efforts and also our operations, as well as prioritizing our vegetation management strategies. And we can also consider the many different trade-offs that occur when you're trying to manage and use many different management strategies, and especially those that are being presented in the symposium. And currently, there is a strong need to focus on invasive management in our wildland fire management strategies in order to reduce fire where it is burning uncharacteristically as well as we need to consider other sagebrush dependent wildlife and plant species and communities across all of these different management strategies. And so with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.